My story. What type of man? Betrayal, abandonment, and post-separation abuse. Chapter 1. My life before Philip Holby. December 2006. It was the week before Christmas, and I was in shock and running completely on autopilot mode. I was meant to be on holiday in Tenerife with my partner John. Tragically, we never made it to the metro station that was just a walking distance from the city centre apartment that we rented. We were packed and ready to leave with our suitcases. We'd locked up and started the short walk to the university metro station that would take us direct to Newcastle Airport for our flights. We had walked as far as the bridge across the train lines that would take us down to the platform when I heard a stumble from behind me. As I looked around, I saw John stagger forward while dragging his suitcase behind him. He took a few steps and then fell forward. His head hit the post of the street light as he fell to the ground. I knew that he had not been well in the past few months, but he didn't complain or seek further medical attention since the last episode he had experienced, we are back in September. I rushed to help him. He was unconscious. I had to lift him up from where he had fallen, his head trapped between the lamp post and the panels of the bridge. I moved him onto his back with no one else around, and as he lay there I called for assistance. I was talking to the person in the call centre who was giving me instructions, telling me to start a heart massage which I started to do. Then I was conscious of people walking by, and one young man suddenly bent down and took over with the heart massage compressions. I stood there watching in disbelief. I could hear the sirens of the ambulance in the distance. It seemed like an absolute eternity while I was watching this young student performing the compressions on John's motionless body. He only stopped to allow the paramedics to take over once the ambulance arrived. In the process of the changeover, I noticed a smile on John's face. At that point, I had this little voice inside of me saying, He is gone. I had this inner thought that he has just met someone he knows and is happy to see them. His sister, perhaps, who had died some time before. A few days later, and I am dealing with funeral arrangements, I'm sitting in the kitchen after having had a meeting with the vicar who was going to be doing the funeral service. He had just left. The radio was on, and I was sitting there. A song was playing, and the words caught my attention. That song was Keeping the Dream Alive by Munchener Freiheit. The lyrics were produced with permission. The hopes we had were much too high. We're out of reach, but we have to try. The game will never be over, because we're keeping the dream alive. I hear myself recalling things you said to me that night it all started, and still the rain is falling. It makes me feel the way I felt when we parted. The hopes we had were much too high. We're out of reach. But we have to try. No need to hide, no need to run, cause all the answers come one by one. The game will never be over, because we're keeping the dream alive. I decided I was going to be keeping the dream alive, the dream we had to run the business together. I chose to purchase this song, and it was played as the people were leaving the funeral service. What did I want? In the weeks I followed, I must admit that it was a struggle. When I felt emotionally well enough to go back to my job, I was allowed a staged return. This was an enormous help. Two days a week, then three days and four days, building up to full time again. Even so, I did sometimes have to retreat into the loose or go grab a quiet coffee and sit alone because the tears would start to flow. What did I write down for my future? For a long time, and since I studied a lot of personal growth and personal development material, 
I have believed in writing down my goals and what I wanted to achieve. That could be health, money, relationships, or environment, or home. Quite often, in periods of transition, like when you lose a job, or get divorced, or the death of your husband or partner, there's a period of confusion, grieving, and sometimes fear. When you are in the mindset of, how will I manage now? How will I manage on my own? What will I do now I have no job? How will I survive with less money coming in? How can I pay the mortgage now? Sleepless nights, restlessness, will all add to the stress of the situation you find yourself in. It was no different for me. I went to work, did what I could, returned home and started overworking on the property management and rental business, calls to follow up on, rents to be collected, maintenance to be booked in. The weeks went quickly, the months flew by, as life just happens. One night, late in January of 2009, I was sitting in my office in the flat. I started thinking about what type of man I want in my life. It had been just over two years since John had died. I had met a couple of boyfriends, but nothing that became serious. Anyway, I was going to write out what I wanted in my next relationship. I took a piece of A4 paper and stared at the blank sheet, thinking about that night out I'd had with friends. I remember a song that was playing in one of the bars. It was Bonnie Tyler singing, holding out for a hero. The words, I need a hero, and he's got to be strong. But what type of relationship was I looking for? I felt totally lost and confused. I don't think I could identify the qualities I wanted in my next relationship. Perhaps I should have started with what I didn't want. Anyway, I wrote on the paper that I wanted a kind and generous man, a friend, a lover, a soulmate, someone to laugh with, someone who I could go on holiday with two or three times a year, a strong man, a confident man, someone to share my life with. I also had a couple of profiles on dating websites and on a site that I was introduced to through a guy I had dated a few times. That other alternative dating mating website was called Informed Consent. It is no longer online. The site was my introduction to BDSM. The relationship dynamic or scene that was made famous by the book and film Fifty Shades of Grey. BDSM stands for bondage and discipline, dominance and submission, plus sometimes sadism and mas masochism. For my profile picture, I had posed in my office wearing suspended stockings and a lace bodice. I was also wearing high heels. I had an automatic digital camera, so I posed bending over my office chair to take the backside view. My, bi my profile bio said, dressed for the office. I was blonde, petite, fun, five foot two, but taller in heels. Within days of that profile going on that site, I was chatting to more than 10 guys, guys that were as far away as London and some a little closer to home in York. Whenever I would go online to chat, I would have four or five conversations going at the same time. I was okay with chatting. It was safe to explore different conversations. But very soon there were two or three guys who were asking to talk on the phone. This actually freaked me a little. I know it's not like there's any danger in talking on the phone. Is there? It was my own fear of how I would sound, my accent, my voice, what would I say? I talked on the telephone to one guy. I wasn't really impressed. Then I had another guy who wanted to chat on a specific evening, plus another guy who I had spoken with. Funny enough, these guys both lived in York. So one evening, I'm in the office and I remember that I was meant to be chatting online, but I also had to set up a chat to another guy on the telephone. 
I open up the website to ch start chatting and as usual, a few people are online. So a number of conversations are happening at once. Then the person who I was meant to chat with appears and says hello. So I reply and exchange a few messages. Then there's a loud bang and a smell of burning. The computer screen goes blank and I realise that it's the PC tower under the desk. So the computer has blown a fuse. So that cuts the conversation short. I never did have that conversation. Perhaps it was a sign that he was definitely not the right person for me. A little later, I pick up my mobile and pluck up the courage to make the phone call to the other guy who was in York. The phone call lasted longer than I thought it would and he sounded really nice. So we arranged a face-to-face -face meeting for later in the week. This is how I met my next partner, the person I started a relationship with in March 2009. It was shortly after my 48th birthday. What did I manifest into my life? I'd found a man who was in business for himself, like me. He seemed like a gentleman, kind and considerate, confident but not overpowering, assertive but not controlling. He described himself as an alpha male. He made me laugh. We laughed together. He was generous. He paid for our first, first holiday together. It was my belief that I had found the man that was to be a friend, a lover and a soulmate, someone that I would share my life with. Of course I was cautious at first. I realised that I should tread carefully. Like any new relationship, you need to take your time to get to know the person before you throw all caution to the wind. Our first date seemed to go well. I remember that I was impressed by his honesty. He told me a number of things about himself that I took at face value. I didn't see anything that could be an issue, although there was one concern that I did have before I met him in person. He had told me to look him up on the internet to do some due diligence and before our first ever meeting and lunch date he advised me to contact a friend and tell the friend that I was meeting someone new, where I was meeting and what time and what I should let the person know when I had met to let them know I was safe. It was always a good idea to tell someone you trust about your date plans. Anyway, before our lunch date I did as he suggested and put his name into the Google search engine and found his business profile. However, I am one of those people that always ends up going a bit deeper and before I know where I am, I am discovering a lot more intimate things about this man that I am about to meet the next day on a lunch date. I had, of course, found him on this alternative dating site that I mentioned earlier, so I had started looking at his profile and after a couple of more clicks and searches, I discovered that, shock horror, he was still married. His current wife also had a profile on this site. She held nothing back in writing about her experience with this man that I was going to be meeting the next day. She called herself Slave Zena. She talked of how they held a ceremony known as collaring. It is all a bit bizarre now I think about it. There were many revelations that I read and thought, what? Really? I was thinking to myself, what type of guy is this person? Perhaps I will need to write another book about some of the experiences I had and some of the situations that played out. But this is not the place for those things. What I did know was that for some very strange reason I still wanted to meet this person. On our first meeting, I felt unsure of how I would come across. I also made a decision not to let him know or say anything about the research and finding out about his wife or slave Zena. I did say earlier that I was impressed by his honesty because he told me he was still married. He told me that the relationship was over, that she had moved out and he was now on his own. It was March 2009 and it was just a week or so after my birthday. 
He told me he had spent his last birthday alone. His birthday is just a few weeks before mine, in February. He also told me a number of other things about his life or lifestyle. He even told me he had been a serial adulterer in his long-term marriage with his ex-wife and the mother of his children. And I was impressed by his honesty. I have this inbuilt trust mechanism. I didn't think he was lying to me or making any of this shit up. So there you have it. I manifested a man who had been a serial adulterer because he was telling me so.